Okay, uh, welcome everyone to our, um, this week's Democracy and Conspiracy and Democracy uh, lecture. Uh, it's a pleasure to have Joe Parent, Joe Krasinski from the University of Miami. Uh, their book, American Conspiracy Theories, is going to be published by Oxford University Press in September? July. July. You haven't seen it. Um, it's a great book. Some of us have had a chance to see it. Uh, they're going to talk about that theme tonight. Okay. Um, it'll be the usual format, talk for about 45 minutes. Um, and then a member of the Conspiracy and Democracy team, Alfred, will do a brief response. There'll be a chance to respond to the response. And then we'll have a discussion. Well, thank you very much uh, for the introduction, and thank you so much for having us out for the week. It's been great so far, and uh, we look forward to the next uh, few days. So I'm Joe Yuzinski. That's Joe Parent. Our project is called American Conspiracy Theories. Um, and I'll say one other reason why we're so happy to be here is when we first got into this, um, it was Kathy Olmsted's work. It was very systematic and also very even-handed in its treatment of these of these issues that kind of guided us through this project. So we're kind of happy that our time overlapped with hers. We didn't even know that until Saturday, I think. So, so it's great to be here and, and have her here for us. So let's set the stage. Re recent polls in the United States suggest that almost everybody believes in one conspiracy theory or another. So let me give you a few examples of that. About 30% of the population right now believes, that, believes in the birther theory, and that is that Barack Obama was born um, in Indonesia or Kenya and is trying to hide his real, his real place of birth from the American population and illegally assert power unconstitutionally. About, about an equal amount on the other side believe that George Bush or the Jews or the oil companies or a combination of all three blew up the Twin Towers on 9-11-2001. And uh, larger than both of those together, uh, about you know, 65 to 90 percent of the population believes in some form of JFK assassination theory. So lots of people believe in conspiracy theories, and this suggests that this is not a fringe phenomenon. Everyone believes in at least one. Most people believe in several. So the next thing is that not only do people believe them, they're not sterilized beliefs, they have um, they have political consequences. So one of those is that they sometimes underlie political gridlock and they can lead to extremist policies. So the first example of that would be back during the Red Scare in the 1950s, Congress passed all sorts of laws taking away the rights of um, people who were suspected to be communists. Another one is that after 9-11, the government tried to pass policies that would uh, fight terror. So for instance, having body scans at, at airports. Um, and a lot of people don't like that. So one example is Senator Rand Paul, who you know goes to the airport and protests every time, and he won't do the body scan. And the final example, and one that's continually ongoing, is with the health care debate, is that uh, Republicans believe that there's death panels hidden inside the health care law, and because of that, they have tried to um, you know get rid of or, 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 or get rid of that bill 40 times now. Unsuccessfully, of course. Um, and this also drove public opinion because in 2010, those Democratic representatives who had voted for that bill were 25% more likely to lose. And it was because so many people believed that they were going to drag in front of a death panel and killed. And then finally, does violence spring from conspiracy theories? And there are arguments that, that, that it does. So one example is Timothy McVeigh who back in 1994 blew up the FBI building in Oklahoma City, killing about 200 people, injuring 600. He believes that the government was conspiring to take away gun rights. Uh, another example is the, the Snarna brothers, who were the uh, Boston, Boston Marathon bombers. Um, they were involved in anti-Jewish conspiracies, and they were 9-11 truthers. And the final example that I'll give you of that is Ruby Ridge, which took place in 1991. And a guy named Randy Weaver, who was a white supremacist, believed that the government was conspiring against people to take away rights. And as it turned out, he was actually right. The government uh, came to his cabin in the woods, shot his wife and his son, and then conspired to conceal the evidence of that. Uh, 
was me. Okay, um, so look, this is the basic organization of our talk. Uh, we're basically asking three questions, and there's a lot of sub-questions that come from that. The first one is, who are the conspiracy theorists? Um, and the second one is about prevalence. What drives the overall <laughs> level of conspiracy talk in the United States? And the third one is about resonance. Why do particular conspiracy theories catch when they do? Slide. Um, that seems like the wrong one. Uh, okay, this is actually back to you, isn't it? Oh, okay, good. <laughs> Teamwork. So when we got into this, we started going through the literature, and one thing that we found is that there's many disciplines who do conspiracy theory work. Sociologists, epistemologists, philosophers, cultural critics, uh, political scientists, um, everybody has a hand in it. But the problem with that is that people uh, from different silos weren't communicating with each other. So, there, well, so as a partial consequence, we haven't had any general theories and people haven't been able to bring in examples and findings from different disciplines into one big theory. So another thing that we found was that most of the studies out there are focused on one historical time period or one or a handful few big conspiracy theories, so JFK, trutherism, birtherism, um, but, they, but they neglected you know, the broader view of conspiracy theories, which there are millions of conspiracy theories out there, but we tend to hear only about a handful of them. So because of that, there isn't a big general theory out there to explain it in total. Instead, there are a lot of ad hoc theories that look at, okay, well, why do people believe in JFK? Why do people believe that Obama was born um, in Kenya? You know, so for instance, if you take that tag, you might say, well, racism is driving the belief in birtherism. And in fact, racism wouldn't drive belief in JFK theories or intrusive theories. So what we wanted to do was get something far more general than what we've seen in the past. But there are also a lot of strengths in previous work, too, uh, that our theory uh, specifically builds off of. And the first one comes from psychology, and that is that there are a lot of findings out there that show that different emotional conditions can lead people to view conspiracy theories where there might not be a conspiracy. So when people feel anxious or if they feel a loss of control, um, they might see patterns that don't exist, they might see conspiracy theories. The only problem with that finding is, as good as it is, is it doesn't tell us what the external or environmental conditions are that would drive this. So what happens in the real world? It's easy for a psychologist to hook somebody up to a machine, spin them around, and then have them see patterns. But that doesn't happen in the real world. The second one is ideology. So ideology could be political, could be religious. Um, in our talk, we're concerned with two types of ideology. And the first is political ideology or partisanship, and then and then the, ideolo the ideology to see conspiracy theories, which we view as orthogonal to um, other political attitudes. So ideology tells people what, what's important and what isn't. It tells people who the good guys and the bad guys are, what our goals are, and how we should go about meeting them. And it also leads people to focus on and, and interpret certain information. So if I tell you something and you're a Republican, you would, you would interpret it in a very different way than if I were to tell you something and you're a Democrat. Okay, so people see different things according to their predispositions. And the final, the final one is, is group identities. And a lot of this work has been done in, uh, by sociologists. So groups in, um, in our book can, can lead to political, can mean political parties, different ideologies, and different demographic groups. And what social identity tells us is that people who feel like they belong to a group may act poorly because they think that their group is so great and the other groups are bad or nefarious. Um, and there's no, really reason, there's no real reason to think that way. It's just that group identities kind of help us with our self-esteem and make us feel like we're better than everyone else. All right, um, so the usual disclaimers and definitions. It's just talking about conspiracy theories is a loaded term of conspiracy theorists and some people think feel like it delegitimizes their, their point of view. We want to keep as far as possible from talking about the truth or falsity of any particular conspiracy theory or throwing pejorative terms back and forth. We just want to study it in the way that you would study volcanoes or something uh, that's just a part of life. Um, so we're not looking at proof or, false or, uh, proof or, or just confirmation, and we're just talking about conspiracy theories in general. We're not trying to tar anybody with a particular brush or dissuade them for their views. Um, now for the terms, also controversial. Conspiracy is a secret arrangement of actors we're trying to usurp political or economic power, violate rights, hoard secrets, or unlawfully alter government institutions. Conspiracies happen all the time. We're not saying they don't. A wrong contract comes to mind. Watergate. 
Uh, the list goes on from there. We're not talking about criminal conspiracies, which are a different sort of legal term. Those are uh, what we would consider retail versus the conspiracies that we talk about are wholesale. They've got to be against you know, big important targets. Uh, and a conspiracy theory is an explanation of histor uh, historical ongoing or future events that cites as a main causal factor a small group of persons acting in secret for their own benefit against the common good. And it's an accusatory perception, which may or may not be true. Um, moving on. <coughs> the other sort of concepts we use uh, that are central to our study are conspiratorial beliefs. And that's your belief in a particular conspiracy theory, whether you believe JFK was shot by a mafia or not. Whereas a conspiratorial thought is an underlying predisposition to see the world more in conspiratorial terms. So you can be highly uh, conspiratorially predisposed to something and not see a specific conspiracy, and you can be not predisposed at all and see a particular conspiracy. You want to draw that distinction early on. Conspiracy talk, we would love to measure beliefs and thought. That's really hard to measure, so we can work forced to measure our manifestations of it, and that's conspiracy talk. And that makes good sense, right? Because if you it just stays between your ears. It's socially sterile. We want to know what the impact is on uh, society. Finally, a conspiracy theorist is basically somebody who espouses a conspiracy theory, not somebody who originates them, which is often what you think is so people adding value or changing the meaning. We just think that if you hold a particular view of conspiracy theory, that you're a conspiracy theorist. All right, let me talk about our argument. Uh, it's basically a three-step argument. It starts out with socialization, and this is the one that people find sort of hardest to accept. That their views are just, you know, uh, what you get by looking for the truth. And it has nothing to do with who their parents were, or who their community was, or any of that stuff. Whereas we're arguing that a lot of your worldview is driven by socialization in the community from which you came. And it obviously doesn't mean that you swallow things whole hog and you believe exactly what your parents believed or exactly what your church said. Um, and yet there's a high amount of uh, correlation between these things. Uh, the next thing is political opportunity. Uh, you can lay the groundwork and have the tinder there, but it just won't catch fire unless there's some sort of spark. So the socialization tells you some sort of underlying predisposition, but you need some sort of ideological trigger to, to, to light that match. Um, and then the behavior, right? So what circumstances bring forth people to talk about conspiracy theories and act on them? Uh, okay, so what do we see from what, what follows from our sort of proto-theory? Um, is that information matters. But it doesn't matter as much as we would like it to. It's not irrelevant, but the truth is some people, some of the time, are just going to be highly predisposed to see conspiracy theories, no matter what. Can't get rid of that. Um, nevertheless, uh, it depends a lot on the context. Who's going to be seeing things and who's not? Um, and the people in the middle turn out to really matter. Right? The higher quality evidence there is that a conspiracy is afoot, the more people are going to believe it. So chapter two of our book talks about Tests you might see that push a conspiracy theory, you know, more believable versus less believable, but it exists along the spectrum. So, for instance, um, think of this as a Cartesian coordinates. Some people just are not going to see, the, they're highly skeptical of conspiracy theories, or they're conversely very accepting of official lines from either scientists or government officials. Some people are the reverse of that, it's just along the spectrum. But this is orthogonal to this is a separate dimension from political predispositions which again offends a lot of people, probably the totality of people in this room, because they feel like the other side of the political spectrum are nut jobs, and they're perfect rationality. Conspiracy theories they see are on the level, and the ones that other people see, uh, those are extremists. Wait, can we go back? Um, so anyway, it, what happens is if, you, if you're inclined to, to see uh, conspiracies, and you're liberal, that's the 30% that say they believe in truth or theories. You know, George Bush was behind 9-11, or at least he knowingly allowed it to happen. And then the mere image of this on the other side of the spectrum is birth of theories, right? If you have a liberal predisposition, and you have, or you're liberally inclined, and you have a predisposition to see conspiracy theories, you're likely you're going to be that 30% that sees the birther. That's a very sturdy number. So we see a lot of partisan symmetry um, that more or less cross cancels. We expect to see a lot of stability in overall conspiracy theorizing. Wait, can we go back? Um, <laughs> Interestingly enough, some things very rarely, and we'll get into cases uh, where this happens, um, gets at both sides of the aisle. Uh, so like the JFK <coughs> theory is probably as popular as it is, because no matter who you hate, they're one of the possible villains. <laughs> right? So there's some, what we call sort of crossover hits, that like both liberals and Republicans, or Democrats and Republicans can get behind. There's also people that are just high conspiratorial predispositions, and sort of in the middle, and they'll believe anything. Right? And they said, they, you know, who's to blame for what's wrong with the world? And they'll just go through the roster, right? They have these laundry lists of all things that drive them crazy. 
They're not very common, but they exist. Right? So they're, they're up there graphically. Okay. I think that's the opposite direction. All right, over to you. Okay, so our data comes from three sources, and the first source is a two-wave survey that we ran uh, the week before the 2012 presidential election and then about two weeks after the 2012 presidential election. Uh, we had 1,230 respondents, and in that survey we asked them about uh, their underlying conspiratorial predispositions. We asked them who they thought they were conspiring, or who was conspiring against the country, and we asked them a bunch of demographic questions. Our second data source comes from uh, letters to the editor of the New York Times. We got 110,000 letters from the New York Times from the years 1890 to 2010, and a validating sample from the Chicago Tribune of about 10,000 letters. Um, now, we use these letters to track public opinion over time and how conspiratorial people were. Uh, so, um, those are our coders right there. Um, so, we, we took the 120,000 letters and we, we coded them along three dimensions. And we used content analysis to do this. And the first dimension was, was the letter written by just a regular member of the public or by an elite? So, by that we mean... Um, a, member of the, a, a member of the House of Representatives or a CEO of a big corporation, but we use a, a very standard definition of, of elite. The second dimension was if the letter engaged in conspiracy talk or not. So were they proffering a conspiracy theory um, or not? And then the third dimension was what, what particular category of villain were they naming? Um, was it the right? Was it the left? Was it capitalists, the communists? Um, was it the government? Was it the media? Was it a foreign body? Or was it some other, uh, some other group of villains? So what does this provide for us? Well, it gives us the first time series of both prevalence and, re and uh, resonance of conspiracy theories. So one of the problems we had when we started the project is that there was no data source that went really far back. I mean, there are spurious polls that have been taken about one conspiracy theory or another, but nothing to get to underlying dispositions and nothing to really cast that, that net that would catch both the big fish and the little fish of conspiracy theories. Now one of the things that we find from this data is that everybody gets named as a villain at one time or another. Okay, so from Jimmy Carter to FDR to the Commerce Secretary to the Chairman of the Fed Reserve to dairy farmers to the firemen, everybody is a cute, everybody's in on it. Uh, and our third data source was from uh, a Google News Alert, which we set up for, to run for a year. And we collected all the news that Google had that contained the word conspiracy theory for, for a year, from 2012 to 2013. That gave us about 3,000 stories that were on the internet. And what this represents is the information environment that one would get if they were interested in conspiracy theories. So let's begin with the polling data and talk about who are these conspiracy theorists and uh, how do they act and how do they think. So we, ask, we begin with a question um, about a much derided institution in the United States and that is the media. Most people don't trust the media, it shouldn't, shouldn't come as a shock, but we asked our respondents, do you believe that the news is deliberately slanted to mislead the American people? And 52% say yes, we do believe that it's deliberately slanted to trick people. Um, And then we asked a more radical question, and that is, do you believe that the elections next week are going to be canceled? So um, about 87% guessed correctly that they would not be canceled, but there were about 5% that say, yes, they're probably going to be canceled, but the people that bother me are the people who don't know if it will be canceled or not, who <laughs> can't make up their mind. Uh, but what do we take from these two slides is that, is that when you have a, a, a common villain that everybody knows about and a common idea of an institution that's been derided for a long time, um, people are going to get into it. When it's something far more radical with a lot less information supporting it, people are going to be more skeptical, and that's what we see right here. So when we ask a more balanced question, let us do secret groups control events like, like the wars and, 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 and the Great Recession, People line up somewhere in the middle. Most people aren't, don't necessarily agree or disagree with that statement. Um, and it looks very symmetrical. So what we go on to do next is to measure people's underlying predispositions to see conspiracy theories. So we, we give three statements and we ask respondents um, to agree or disagree with these statements. And the first one is much of our lives are being controlled by plots hatched in secret places. 
then even though we live in a democracy, a few people are going to run things anyway, and the people who really run the country are not known to the voters. Now, the truth of any of these doesn't matter so much as much as people's propensity to believe in them or not. So what do the results show? Most people tend to be a little bit in between neither agree or disagree and agree. So those are the three questions. And what we do with those is we combine them into one measure through factor analysis. So that gives us one number that represents how predisposed people are to see, conspir uh, see conspiracy theories. So now we take this measure and we want to validate it. So we compare it to a question we asked about, um, do you trust the government or not? And what we find is the people high on, this, on our conspiratorial predisposition scale, 60% of them say, no, we can't trust the government. But the, we find that these tend to go down as we get to the people who are very low on the conspiracy predisposition scale. We find the same thing here, is that when we ask people, if we return to the question of, do you believe that secret groups control things like the recession and the, and the wars, people low on that scale, 10% believe it, we got 55% of the high people do. So what we're showing here is that it's the predisposition is driving the willingness to have distrust and to see specific conspiracy theories. So now let's look at uh, you know, what do these conspiracy theorists look like? Now, if you were to close your eyes and imagine you know, you're a conspiracy theorist, you might see a white, middle-aged guy in his garage listening to a two-way radio with a, some sort of you know, uh, tinfoil hat on to block the alien rays. Um, you should jettison that view immediately. Because what we find is here, when we look at uh, the distribution of predispositions to see conspiracy and gender, we find that men and women are just about equal. Okay. So imagine you're Jenny McCarthy who tells people, we think that, that big pharmaceutical companies are putting um, autism into the vaccines, don't get your kid vaccinated. Okay. And if you thought the, the conspiracy theorists might have, been, might have been white, now it's likely that they're probably a minority. So here we see very strong effects for both um, black respondents and Hispanic respondents. And if we combine people who are high and medium on our, on our predisposition scale, um, blacks and Hispanics uh, went out over whites. Even though, interestingly, right, right now we find that whites tend to have the most people who are scoring high on it. And if you thought that the conspiracy theorists might be uneducated, well, that's one thing where you would have guessed right, and that is that those without high school education tend to be highest here, and it shoots downward as they get um, into the postgraduate. Now, we probably all know a fellow faculty member or a fellow academic who is a conspiracy theorist. So again, we're dealing in generalities and not specifics. Um, but the trend is, um, is there. Now, it's certainly not causal. Uh, we would not argue that getting more education will drive the conspiracy theorizing out of someone. It could be a self-selection process where people um, who like academia just aren't conspiracy theorists. It could also work the other way, where academics don't want to work with entering students who are conspiracy theorists. Now, in terms of political behavior, um, do they act differently politically than people who are less predisposed to see conspiracy theories? So when we ask people, are you going to vote in the upcoming uh, presidential election, those high, or, or those high on the predisposition scale um, were, were the least likely to say that they were going to vote, and those low were the most likely to say they were going to vote by, more than, by about 25 points. Now, the, inter the good thing about the survey is, after it was done, they went back and validated this question <coughs> to see if the people actually voted or not from the voter rolls. And what they found is that this absolutely holds when you look at actual voting um, when, when compared to intent to vote. And we also see amongst a whole range of other behaviors, like running for office, donating money, working for candidates, and putting up signs, that, that the trend is very clear here. Those who are high in the dimension tend to be least likely to take part in that. And particularly interesting is that when it comes to running for office, they're half as likely as, as, as the lower conspiratory people to want to run for political office. And we might think that's probably a good thing. We always tend to hear about these politicians like Hitler or Donald Trump or Jesse Ventura um, who want to run for, for political office. They go, oh my god, the, you know, Congress can be overrun with all these conspiracy people. Um, but they're the least likely to do it. And those, those examples are, are very much outliers. Um, compared to what we see here. As a quick aside, notice that that dynamic is actually self-sustaining, right? 
this group of people think that they're, someone's out to get them, politically powerful out to get them, and so they don't take part in the system, which means that politicians have no incentive to take their preferences into account, which means they get increasingly bad political outcomes where they never improve their political lot. Um, and so it's hard to break out of that cycle. Back to you. So are, are, are the conspiracy theorists located on one side of the political spectrum or the other? Well, the short answer is they are evenly dispersed between both the left and the right. If anything, we find effects that people in the middle tend to be a little bit more predisposed to see conspiracy theories than the people far out. So one thing we should not do is try to confuse political <coughs> extremism with conspiracy theory. Because they're very different things. One thing that we do find here, and here we're looking at uh, this is ideology, and here we're looking at partisanship, is that the people most predisposed is that small number of people who claim that they belong to some other party. And those people tend to be um, um, the most predisposed to be very, thinking very highly in, in, in conspiratorial terms. And we will, that's an idea that we'll come back to later. Now, when we ask people, um, you know, who do you think is conspiring against the country, um, we get different answers from both Democrats and Republicans. They're both equally likely to think someone's conspiring, it's just a different person that they think is doing it. So for Republicans and the light, you know, they believe that liberals and communists are conspiring against them, and for the Democrats in the dark, they think that the conservatives and the corporations are out to get them. And in terms of economic behavior, um, if you're a conspiracy theorist, you should be super rich. And the reason is you know who's plotting and you know what the scheme is and you know what they're up to. So you should have the market cornered. But unfortunately, um, the conspiracy theorists don't use their specialized knowledge to their financial advantage. And when asked if they own stocks or not, people high on the conspiracy theory list are most likely to not own any stocks. And people who don't believe in conspiracy theories um, own them far more. And the industries that, that that those high on the predisposition scale tend to work in are healthcare and construction. So next time you're at the doctor's office, um, ask them who killed JFK, they probably know. <laughs> um, the industries that conspiracy theorists tend not to work in are government, military, and in the financial industry. And the final thing we wanted to look at with the survey was um, can we find out if, if having these predispositions to see conspiracies leads people to um, have a predisposition to violence? And we asked a few different questions, and we'll show the results to one, and that is, how accepting are you of violence against the government? And, and the trend is fairly clear here, is that those who are high on the conspiracy um, predisposition scale are, are the most accepting of violence against the government. Now, this does not mean that anyone's actually going to go out and do violence. It just means they're more accepting of it. And the thing is, if even 1% of these people were to go out and do political violence, then you know, there would be bloodshed in the streets every day. But there isn't. Okay? So we're not measuring behavior here. All right. Um, let's talk about what's driving the overall incidence of conspiracy talk. And this is what our data looks like. So. At first view, you go, oh my God, it's just a jagged line. Um, not, not so. Can I borrow the forehead, please? Um, OK, we get two big spikes, right? one in the mid-1890s and the second in the 1950s. Um, the 1950s one is so <laughs> obvious. That's the Red Scare. It's McCarthyism. Um, and the 1890s is a little less obvious. But what do these two things have in common? We argue that what they have in common is they're the rare conspiracy moments that can get people from both sides of the aisle. Right? When McKinley wins the election in 1896, it's just partisan realignment. And big business goes firmly into the camp of Republicans, where they've been ever since. Um, before that, there was um, you know, antitrust, that antitrust moment, right? When it looked like big business was a threat to everybody. Um, and so this was kind of this moment that Republicans and Democrats could say, hey, big business. And you can see in the, in the granular detail of the, the letters, that that's actually what they're saying. Um, fast forward to the 1950s, that's exactly what you think it is. Right? Everybody's afraid about the Red Menace, and the Soviets are permeating society, and this is something we can all get, get behind. Um, but over time, there, again, the threat abates in some sense. We sort of get used to living with the Soviet threat and nuclear weapons and a lot of things that are freaking people out for the first time. And we've seen bipolarity in their lifetime. Um, and also the Republicans sort of take charge of Red Scare stuff, and it becomes Again, it's got a political valence that it didn't have as much before. 
Um, but one of the other things that might not be as apparent on this is that a lot of people uh, talk about how now is the age of conspiracy, right? We look just conspiratocracy, you know, conspiratopia. You know, now's the time. People are crazy. You know, we haven't seen this since the Balkans in 1914. Um, what's cool about it, guys, we can show you that's not the case. Uh, actually, if there's a if there's a slope to this, it's going down, and it's been going down since the 1960s. Um, and we can say this with a fair amount of confidence. No data source is perfect, but ours is better than what's out there. Um, and most of the, the studies that have been done, you can cherry pick conspiracy theories all day long. You can say, you know what's really important is uh, the Red Scare and JFK, or whatever. You can make any point you want by picking whatever examples you want. What's cool about our data is that it gets the big fish and the little fish, and it turns out the little fish are more common than the big fish which makes a certain amount of sense, but we don't see that. A lot of that just gets lost because we're only picking the prominent cases. When you look at all the cases, the curve is, is headed down. Um, all right, so that's the quick overview. Let me talk about what explains prevalence over time. We uh, claim the originality for this. We collected a number of popular um, theories about conspiracy theories and tried to get proxies for them and run them through the data to see what comes up for multiparent progression. Um, and the only one that works is the information environment, which is to say what showed up on the cover of the New York Times. That's how we're measuring that. Um, so in some sense, and people are basically taking elite cues uh, for what their views are. Um, so this is in some sense heartening, right? Not everything gets run up the flagpole. Only the things that seem to have pretty good evidence behind them are, are leading to these spikes. What doesn't explain prevalence, the big one that we are like scratching our heads was the economy. We thought that me measures of economic misery would drive the overall level up. It doesn't seem to. Right? And the image is Hitler rides that 1930s wave into glory or in infamy. Um, we don't see that in the American case. What about things like media delivery, like the onset of television and internet? I mean, we have a bunch of proxy measures for this, but it doesn't correlate as the upshot. Right? As TVs and internet catch on, conspiracy theories go down. And this makes sense, right? Largely, the media market is a market, and it's driven by what consumers want. And generally, consumers, you know, there are those people that are high in the conspiracy dimension on either side of the spectrum that are demanding that stuff, but they're fairly consistent in their demands. So the overall picture is one of stability here. Um, movie television book, we measure things like, uh, you know, the X-Files and movie conspiracy theory. Like when there's a bunch of media content out there that's pretty high profile, does that seem to do anything to the curve? The answer is no. Um, technology, we're looking at things like patents. You know, is this technophobia? Are people afraid that you know, the, the society is getting out of hand? That doesn't seem to work either. Um, group status, uh, which we measure as the number of, um, of women and minorities in the House of Representatives, that doesn't correlate either. Maybe because it's a zero sum thing. As one group status went down, another went up, and conspiracy basically cross canceled. Um, big government, similar story. Uh, I personally had a theory that I thought the more powerful government was, the more conspiracy theorizing uh, you would see. Yeah, that doesn't turn out to be true. Um, if it did, like government as a percentage of, of uh, GDP has been going up and up in the United States, and this graph goes in the opposite direction. So it looks like whatever the Republicans say, it's not that people fear big government, it's that they fear big government that, that they don't control. Um, what about polarization? Uh, as you, know, you hear a lot about red states and blue states in the United States, how is that affecting conspiracy theories? We know that polarization and income inequality have been going up. The, the correlation is like 0.9. It's been going up and up and up since the mid-1960s. Again, you don't see that in this graph, and that makes sense on our argument. Again, this doesn't have a lot to do with your partisan ideal point. This has a lot to do with where you are in the conspiracy dimension, whether you're predisposed or not. In some sense, you can go to the extremes, and conspiracy theories will be about as common. Um, and finally, war. Again, not a partisan issue. Um, oops, wrong way. Let me talk about resonance. Right. Our basic theory of resonance um, is it's the distribution of power. Right. This is sort of political science 101, that insecurity drives unity, um, and that what conspiracy theories are is that they're, they're, they're a way for groups to survive. Right. It's basically um, scapegoating is a reprehensible behavior that is socially adaptive. Um, as groups become more successful, they are less prone to conspiracy theorizing. 
Um, because groups do two things, right? They coordinate and they distribute. First, they've got to get together to like, create a pot of honey, and then they have to divide that pot of honey. And those two things are in tension. So the better they get at coordination, the, the, the harder the infighting is on distribution. And the worse they do, the more they sort of put let bygones be bygones and, uh, and coordinate to get, with the, you know, to, to get back on top. So there's, um, I mean, you guys have heard this in a million ways, but there's some Spanish proverb, the vanquished vanquished, the victor's undone. And that's basically the logic of our argument. When you get a, a strong foreign threat, it's going to push people together, and they're, gonna, they're still going to see conspiracies. They're just going to see them outside. And when those threats go down, you're going to see them turning on each other and saying, you're out to get me. I want a bigger slice of that pie. Um, and those subnational threats can come in lots of forms, but we generally say that it correlates with political parties because that's where the power is. So fundamentally, there's a lot of arguments about, uh, about where conspiracy theories come from. We're trying to put uh, politics front and center. Right? It's in just about everybody. It's baked into everybody's cake. But we're trying to say this primacy of political, that's what's going on here. And when you see concentrations of power, that's where you're going to see sort of all the arrows shot from the conspiracy quiver. So where do we most expect to see what's, what's driving conspiracy theories in the United States? The president. Right? It's the largest concentration of power uh, in the country. Followed by the Congress, because there's 500 out of them, a little bit less concentrated, but they still have much power. Followed very decently by the not very strong Supreme Court. Um, but um, when there's a war, all those things are put aside. So we talk about a world major conflicts, right? So like Vietnam, your chances of violent death in Vietnam are pretty low if you're an American. In fact, I've heard statistics that you had a larger chance of dying if you didn't serve uh, in the war in, in the United States Army from 1950 to 2000 than if you did, because that demographic of males is actually quite good at killing themselves. Um, but whatever, this applies to third parties and social movements. We can talk about that in the Q&A. But the bottom line, our take home point on resonance is conspiracy theories are for losers. And we don't mean this in a pejorative way. We're saying we're all losers. We all take turns losing things like elections and wars you know, that threaten us and all these other things. When you lose, it's not your fault. It has to be somebody else's fault. Right? And that's, who takes, that's what conspiracy theories are often there to do, is to place the blame on a small group of people so that the rest of you get to escape blame. Okay, so you probably can't see this because it's in uh, two-point font, but um, the breakdown is this is left and right. They're basically equivalent. Okay? Population of villains in the sample, there's about as many left-leaning villains as right-leaning villains. Um, this is capitalist versus communist. Same story there. Right? One of the major motifs in what our findings is partisan symmetry. Right? You keep seeing this over and over again. Republicans and Democrats are about likely the same stuff. Um, well, who's popular? Foreign, foreign is a huge slice of foreign enemies are a huge slice of our conspiracy villains. Um, less popular is the government, but still quite popular. And the media is, is a very small disliked group. And finally, we've got other just the catch-all category. Um, and in this graph, what you're looking at is when years of a Republican is president, uh, the right gets blamed all the time. Years when a Democrat is uh, president, the left gets blamed all the time. Years when a Republican is president, capitalists get blamed all the time. Years when Democrats in office, uh, socialism or communism get, gets is, you know, the enemy du jour. And you can see this like almost instantaneously in the data. Right? As soon as George W. Bush loses the election, people are like, Halliburton who? I want to see a birth certificate. And, uh, and it happened you know, when Nixon left off. There's a bunch of like, moments where a lot of things fall off. Um, media, government, you can see they're about equally likely. There's no partisan uh, uh, valence to either of those. Um, and then because a Democrats serve longer than Republicans, that actually looks more tilted than it is, but it more or less comes out to be equal. All right, this is just zooming in on what I just told you. Um, all right, getting to this, what, ha oops, what happens when you've got uh, elevated foreign threat, by which we mean Spanish-American War, World War I, World War II, the Cold War, things like that. We have a declaration of war. There's a major chance of things going very wrong for the average American. 20 points higher than the moments when you don't have those major threats. All right, so the sort of first thing you want to pay attention to is international threat. But the second thing you want to pay attention to um, is domestic threat, and that's where you see the party of the president be driving a large portion of this. So uh, to wrap up the prevalence and resonance discussion, 
We can only explain, I don't know, maybe 17% of the prevalence story. There's a lot of really interesting work to be done, and I hope somebody in this room does it, um, trying to explain why the overall level goes as far as it does, or it bounces around the way it does. Um, we can't explain that, but there's clearly something going on there, and a lot of the ideas we think should work don't work. So there's this big wide field open for somebody to do something cool there. Resonance, though, we think we pretty much have that one sewn up. Right? A lot of that is, is picked up by very simple factors like the party, the president, and whether there's a great power war in the offering. All right, let me turn this over to my co-author. So um, based on the findings that we, that we have, um, we're gonna, we're gonna conclude by saying what conspiracy uh, beliefs are, what they're not, and then what we should or shouldn't do about them. So, so what, what does our data suggest that conspiracy beliefs are not? And the first is that you know, it's not an individual or a mass psychosis. Um, if you think that conspiracy theories are crazy, or conspiracy theorists are crazy, you should get rid of that notion, because it's not crazy. When you, talk to, when you talk to doctors who deal with seriously ill, crazy, pathological people, they say they don't believe in conspiracy theories. They believe in you know, grand delusions that they're Jesus or something like that. But it's not conspiracy theories. They don't care about JFK. So that's not it. And the second thing I would say there is that almost everyone believes in one conspiracy theory or another, so we can't all be crazy. Or we are, I don't know. Um, the second one is that these, these really aren't simple explanations for complex events, because as we go through our data, and, and of course simplicity is in the eye of the holder, but many conspiracy theories are far more complicated than either the cock-up story or the, um, or, or the official narrative. So, and if you look at some conspiracy theories, they're very herky-jerky with all sorts of different actors getting involved, you know, from the media, working with the FBI, working with the Jews, and it just, just gets, it blows out of control. Um, third thing, it's not a product of the internet. And with, with our, our internet data, one thing we looked at was, you know, how do these um, internet news stories treat conspiracy theories? And the answer is very negatively. Almost 70% of the 3,000 stories that we coded treated them um, as if they were false, and they used words like crazy, um, uh, un untrue, unsupported by evidence to describe the conspiracy theory. It was less than 20% that treated the conspiracy theory that they were writing about positively. Okay? So the information environment does not push this. Okay? And the other thing I would say there is that conspiracy theories have existed for a long time long before you know, the mid-90s when the internet started to blow up. Uh, four, um, they're not uh, equivalent to political extremism. You know, Ted Kaczynski was a political extremist. He mailed bombs to people and blew them up. Okay, very extreme, he, he, and he wrote a book about it. But none of it was conspiratorial. So extremism and, conspir and conspiracism are not the same thing. Okay. You know, and one thing that we found sometimes with the polling data is that sometimes the people who are very much in the middle politically who are most likely to um, have strong conspiratorial predispositions. And finally, we don't find that it's a rejection of science. What it is instead is a rejection of science that we don't like. And everybody does this to some extent. Um, if you tell me that scientists found something that I don't agree with, I'm going to disagree with those findings, but I'm not going to reject science. I'm going to go find my own scientist to say the things that I agree with, and I'm going to say, oh my god, that's good science. Finally, a real scientist who, who isn't uh, been corrupted by corporations or big government. All right, what conspiratorial beliefs are is basically a strategy. It's a tool that raises awareness, indicates your vulnerabilities, applies measures to shore up defense. Right, sort of group survival. Um, so it's a way to explain losses by scapegoating, which absolves people from blaming the groups against foes. Fundamentally, I'm telling you, strategic logic to conspiracy theories. Uh, I think the best ex uh, analogy I heard was Georg Zimmel who said, you know, a lot of group action looks crazy and circuitous, but it's like a river. It actually knows what it's doing. It's getting there in the most efficient way possible. You just don't understand the terrain. Um, but a lot of this is balancing against threat. Right, that's the sort of that's the core logic of what we're talking about. Shifts in distribution of power are going to change the, the picture of how conspiracy theories are distributed across time and space. All right, policy recommendations. Um, we say democracy, so uh, our findings only in theory apply to democracy. I know that the, the group here is also looking into autocracies. Um, a logical corollary that we don't test because our data is all American is that. Um, you know, losers, disenfranchised groups are the ones most prone to conspiracy theorizing. We wouldn't be surprised if Pakistan and India are some of the most, or sorry, Pakistan and Egypt are some of the most prone to conspiracy theorizing because there's a lot of disenfranchised people for a long period of time. Um, 
But we can wave our hands and speculate about that, talk about the Q&A, but we can't speak directly to it from our data. Um, a lot of what has to be done according to our logic is being done. Right? We can tell you who's likely to be targeted, the president, right? the Congress people, but these are the people that are already being the most protected. So unless you're JFK or Doc Hammarskjöld, um, there's not much we can do to help you. Right? In general, protect the people we think ought to be protected, uh, and they're doing that. There's a lot of people that recommend, the way we get rid of this is a top-down approach. Cass Sunstein's the most famous, he uh, writes very eloquently on this. Um, and he says, look, we need to infiltrate these groups to see what they're up to. These guys are up to no good. We need to censor them so their points of view don't get out there. We need uh, maybe government combatants to give more authoritative accounts of why they're wrong. And we think this is counterproductive and probably ineffective. Um, it's, in fact, uh, these groups' weakness that drives their conspiracy theorizing. And by highlighting their weakness, by censoring them and muzzling them and trying to pressure them to change their views, you're just going to make it worse. Um, so we actually advocate bottom-up approaches. Uh, and this is a much more modest, minimalist account, but we feel like people are entitled to have their views and you should leave them alone if they want to have it. So long as they're more or less peaceful and they more or less are, and we should return the favor and leave them be. If you want to convince people, convince them as your neighbor, as their friend, as a colleague, but not from a position of authority because this is about power and the more you use authority, the less it's going to work. So. A lot of what we say is basically, uh, you expect this to come from two PhDs, right? Use the scientific method more, right? Be more, apply evidence evenly and impartially. Listen to what other people have to say. Um, and we have some standards about how you might have rough rules of thumb to figure out if something more or less conspiratorial. Um, but a lot of this boils down to just understanding epistemology. And why do you know the things that you know? And are you wishful thinking? How would you know if you were wrong? You know, it's all the stuff that you're supposed to learn in political science 101. Right? Science doesn't really tell you what you definitely should believe, but it tells you things that are probably wrong, and you should at least acknowledge when you're probably wrong. But if you want to acknowledge that and still believe it, we're fine with that. Um, I believe that's all we have to say. With that, we'll turn it over to you and open it to questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. to trust in government. And yet one of the sort of common places of political science research is that you know, trust in government in the advanced democracies, let's say in America, has been <coughs> since the 1950s. Or sort of, typically they'd, they would say it's declined from the 60s to the 80s and then maybe bounced around a bit at a lower level since then. So how does the trust story, is, is the trust story completely unconnected? Is it a different thing altogether? So that was something I was kind of curious about. And then the other question I had about the, the sort of what stayed the same uh, is like if, if conspiracy talk is either stable or declining, then why is there so much conspiracy theory talk? If there have always been accusations of conspiracy theory, then you know, what, what is it that makes the emergence of conspiracy theory as a category, as in the, you should say, and as, as, as a sort of, um, and as a problem, you know? And we've been looking, one of the things we see is it emerging, at least in the 50s or 60s, as a sort of identifiable category, but then much more recently as a problem, as a problem that social scientists investigate, as a problem that um, governments want to respond to. So, um, you know, why so much conspiracy theory talk? Um, and that takes me to my final point, which is something that you sort of touch on at the beginning and end, but I just want to press you a little more on, for they actually 
you, you know my own sort of uh, tendency, my own view on this. But one of the features of conspiracy theory talk today, as I said at the beginning, is that it's anxious, right? It's, it thinks there's a big problem with conspiracy, that there's a danger to democracy in conspiracy theories, not just in conspiracies. And you know that conspiracy theories distract government. Why is Obama spending time uh, answering further allegations when he should be you know, making sure the healthcare website works properly? It sort of fuels non-cooperation as you know, parents refuse to get their children vaccinated and undermine a democratically authorized public policy. You know, it distorts deliberation because people have misinformation, they misinterpret facts, they can't, you know, they can't align what they want with what they vote for. And then, of course, you talk about violence as well. So, you know, there are all these people correcting, trying to correct conspiracy theories or trying to correct misconceptions. Um, it's not immediately clear to me that conspiracy theories are a problem for democracy. And you seem to kind of go both ways. I mean, you mentioned at the beginning all of these problems, but then at the end, and also the sense I get from your sort of prevalence story is that actually you could read the prevalence of conspiracy theories as a feature of partisan stability. Like, and that what you're talking about in these eras between, say, the partisan realignment in the 1890s, between the Red Scare, are periods of relative partisan stability, and that these are then ordinary features of democratic politics that you shouldn't necessarily worry that much about. So um, I just wanted to expand then on that democratic problem of, of <coughs> But that's all. And so, uh, yeah, we'll look forward to it. Thank you. I need the bed, too, if you get the front. Uh, the trust. Trust. Um, so trust is a, is a funny thing, and there's a lot of work on political trust and why it changes over time. And it, you, in, in when, we, when social scientists used to ask people, you know, do you trust the government or not, they used to get honest answers. And most people trusted the government. Most people still do trust the government. It's just it's very fashionable now to say, no, they don't. Um, so following that measure over time, you have to think of it relatively because as we move um, after the 1980s, everyone says, no, I don't trust it at all. But if that was the case, and it's, it was continually declining as it seems to be, then no one would trust the government, no one would participate, and there would be uprising. Um, but it's just w what we're finding is, is that those particular measures um, aren't that good, and it's just fashionable to say, I don't trust the government. Another thing that that measure doesn't pick up is that I can think anyone's conspiring against me. It doesn't have to be the government. There's this idea that, you know, if we, I believe in conspiracy theories, it must be the government that I, that I hate. I might love the government, um, but just think that Republicans are out to get me, or the Democrats are out to get me, or the big corporations are out to get me. Okay? So think about groups like um, uh, Millions Against Monsanto. They believe the corporation Monsanto um, is creating genetically modified food, and they're going to take over the populace by, you know, uh, destroying our food supply and charging us a lot for crappy tomatoes. What do those people want? I mean, they clearly believe in a conspiracy theory that a corporation is taking over the world with, you know, bad food seeds. But what do they want to happen? They want government to step in. So they trust government just fine. It's just they want it to do what they want it to do and not what Monsanto wants it to do. Okay. So there are going to be times where, where trust in government comes in as a player in this and other times where it might not, it might not matter so much. I was tweeting back and forth with the, with, with the 911truth.org organization, which is, you know, number one uh, truther group in, in the United States. And they were, they were saying, you know, we really want government-run health care. And I tweeted to them and I said, well, if you believe the government killed 3,000 people on 9-11, they slaughtered 3,000 of their own people, why do you want them in charge of your health care? Shouldn't you believe in death panels? I mean, you're the perfect people to believe in death panels. Say, no, it's the corporations, the health insurance corporations we don't like. Government's great. It doesn't make sense. It's just government's good when they control it and not when they don't. Um, as for the other two questions, um, why is why conspiracy theories uh, as a problem, as a category, been uh, inclining since the 1950s? Uh, and here, uh, we actually owe a big debt to Richard Hofstetter, obviously not just in this topic, but uh, in some of our arguments. Um, we have some objections to his stuff because Hofstetter sort of does this really brilliant essay on the paranoid style in American politics. He describes it over time, and it's really like vivid. And then he gets to the end, he's like, why does that happen? And he's like, social clashes, and religious clashes, and ideological clashes. And like, but those happen all the time, right? Why is it that it takes particular forms at particular times? Why would it go up and down over time? And Hofstetter's like, everything causes it, the end. 
Um, so we hope to be able to, in some sense, have moved the ball forward from where Hofstadter did by actually nailing down the scope conditions when particular things will cause particular outcomes. Um, but one of the things he talks about uh, in anti-intellectualism uh, in American life is that one of the reasons you see this big backlash in the 50s is because science is becoming so powerful. Intellectuals are becoming so powerful, and this is a backlash against them. And this more or less fits with the logic of our argument, right? It's the, it's the rise of these people that you're becoming more dependent upon, which means you want to kick them more and keep them in, you know, in control. Um, it could also be, uh, so that's part of the answer, right? Is maybe it has something to do with an increased reliance on uh, uh, intellectuals. I think probably a more compelling argument is uh, post-materialist values. Probably conspiracy theories were always a thing. They were just like relative to getting food on your table and you know not getting stabbed in a knife fight and not going to war with your neighbor. Like it just was way down on the list. And when you were, after the 1950s, when things start, you start looking around like, what else is a problem? Conspiracy theories sort of rise up the list. Um, as for conspiracy theory and democracy, it's hurting policy and implementation. Um, and is it a problem? Um, if you read the Federalist Papers, and it's it's the best my country's done as far as political theory on a deadline too, which makes me feel bad given what I write. Um, they had to do it much faster and they did it better. Um, it, it's all signed by Publius, right? And then you go, well, who was Publius? And Publius was this ancient uh, Roman who led a rather spotless life. Um, and everyone kept pointing the finger at him, right? And saying, you're trying to take away our liberties. You're trying to take away our rights. You're trying to take away our money. You're trying to take away. And he's like, what is it going to take for you people? Like, I've given up all my money. I've given up everything. I live in a regular house right next to the rest. You can see me do what I do. I've served you without staying my whole career. And I, this never stops. And then, when he was safely dead, they all celebrated him. They said, look at him, spotless virtue. Went through his whole life. They were just riding him the whole time. The issue wasn't his character. The issue was his position. He had power, and they worried about it. And that's just the way government is. It's nothing peculiar to democracy. Um, so is this, is this, you know, there's nothing peculiarly de democratic about it. It's just always a problem. This is something always people are worrying about because if you have power, you could abuse power. Anything that can be used to help people can be used to hurt people, if only by withholding it. Um, so is this a problem? I don't know. In some sense, we think of, um, uh, you know, a lot of people talk about the media as watchdogs. And we actually think the real watchdogs here are probably conspiracy theorists. And some of them are just barking all the time and you kind of tune it out. But some of the other dogs take their cues from the ones that are much more sensitive and bark very quickly, and they start barking. And then when a bunch of people start barking, we think there's a problem, there's something going on, the media starts to pay attention to it. Um, so, you know, like, what do we owe to Bernstein and Woodward? A lot, right? They were one of those early watchdogs that started barking. Something's, something's here, something's here. Nobody bought it for a really long time. And they had to keep producing more evidence and more evidence until it unrivaled. Um, so we think conspiracy theorists are broadly healthy. Um, they might not be attractive, they might be annoying, um, and they might lead to some bad outcomes, but relative to what? If the world didn't work this way, and I don't know, I can't, it's hard for me to imagine that counterfactual universe, but if, if they didn't exist, what would the world look like? And I suspect it would probably be inferior.